Allison Williams representing the League of Women Voters of Bellingham and Whatcom County. Tonight we have Spanish interpretation available. If you're watching via Zoom, you may use the interpretation symbol on your screen and select Spanish to hear the program in your preferred language. Founded in 1920, the League is a nonpartisan organization with more than 700 affiliates in all 50 states. Our goals are to encourage informed and active participation in government, increase an understanding of major public policy issues, and influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League never endorses candidates or political parties. Membership is open to all people age 16 and older, and we invite you to join. Tonight's forum is being broadcast on the City of Bellingham YouTube channel and BTV. Recordings of this program in English and Spanish will be available on the League of Women Voters Bellingham Whatcom County website, lwbellinghamwhatcom.org. The forum will be rebroadcast on Bellingham Community Television, BTV, through Election Day, August 2nd. No portion of this forum may be rebroadcast in part or in full without the written consent of the League of Women Voters Bellingham Whatcom County. Questions for this forum have been prepared in advance by the League with input from the public. The Cascadia Daily News, the Linden Tribune, Salish Current, the Northern Light, and 102.3 KMER Community Radio are media partners. Tonight, we're hosting candidates for the 42nd Legislative District Representative Position Number 2 race. The Washington State House of Representatives has 98 members. Two are elected from each of the districts in the state. During legislative sessions, the legislator is called upon to enact or reject legislation affecting public policy in the state, provide for the levy and collection of taxes and other revenue to support state government and assist local government and appropriate funds for these purposes. Although laws are enacted only when the legislature is convened in formal session, policy issues and the general operation of state and local government are under continuous review by legislators who serve on permanent and interim study committees. Washington state representatives serve two-year terms and their annual salary is $57,876. I would now like to introduce and welcome the candidates. We have um, Joe Timmons and Richard May. Both Kyle Christensen and Dan Johnson are also candidates, but were not able to attend this evening. Here are the rules that we'll follow. Each candidate may make a two minute opening statement and then each candidate will be asked to respond to the same questions. Candidates will have up to 90 seconds for answers, and then the candidates will give a one minute closing statement. I will ask candidates to speak in the same order as they appear on the ballot. The timer displayed on the screen will count down the time. Timer will be green when you begin, then turn to yellow when 15 seconds remains. And when time is up, the timer will turn red and chi a chime will ring. If you continue to speak after the time limit, we may cut your microphone. Are there any questions regarding the rules from either of our candidates? I, I have a question, please, Allison. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, in terms of the questions, and are, are we gonna do the same order of answers or are we gonna alternate or how is that going to work in terms of questions and answers? Yeah, I'm gonna ask, so the order is going, because it, you'll be asked in the order that you're on the ballot. So Joe, I'm gonna ask you the question first and then Richard will be asked and then I'll keep repeating in that order. This, the same order for each question. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so any other questions? Okay. So if our timers are ready, then um, we can start. So as I said, um, candidate Timmons, that you will, you will be giving your opening statement. You have two minutes. Timer is ready. Um, I will point out, Allison, that at the last forum, we switched the order of who went first with the question. We're not doing that this time. That wasn't what I understood, but we can we can do that that way if we all agree to that. If you want to switch the order, and yes, I can I, I can alternate. Yes. Yes, please. Okay, sure. Is that acceptable to both the candidates? 
Candidate May and Timmons. Okay, so it sounds great. Okay. All right, so candidate Timmons, um, you can proceed with your opening statement. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here and uh, for the work that you do in our community. Uh, Allison, as you said, my name is Joe Timmons. Uh, I'm a Democrat running for the open seat in the 42nd legislative district. I grew up in a working class household. My dad's a pipe fitter and my folks created a small business out of our garage when I was five years old. Growing up in that environment, I learned the values of hard work, honesty, and integrity, and I greatly respect my parents for teaching me those important values at such a young age. I've dedicated my career to public service because I want everyone to have the same opportunities that my parents had. I uh, went to Western Washington University where I studied political science and earned a master's in public administration from the University of Washington in order to learn the skills to be effective in public service and government. And I spent the last decade working at the local, state, and federal levels of government. And I'm particularly passionate about state government and making state government work for all of us. It's really why I'm running for this position at the state level. I currently work in the governor's office as our Northwest Washington Regional Representative, where I uh, serve uh, as our boots on the ground and represent the state to local communities throughout Whatcom, Skagit, Snohomish Island, and San Juan counties. Previously, I worked at Western Washington University in government relations, where I helped advocate for the university in Olympia. And I'm really proud of some of the accomplishments we were able to achieve, including lowering tuition while keeping the university whole, uh, getting funds for student support services on campus that help particularly first generation students such as academic advising, mental health counseling and tutoring services. And of course, building capital projects on campus that not only help the university, but help stimulate the local economy. Uh, I love Whatcom County. I've lived in Whatcom County for more than a decade. My wife, Heather, grew up here and we're proud to be raising our son Malcolm here and near Heather's parents, Scott and Kathleen McGinnis, who also dedicated their careers to this community. Um, I've served on boards of the city of Bellingham and the Bellingham Food Bank, and I, I hope to earn your vote. And I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, candidate Timmons. Uh, candidate May, you, you're, you can proceed with your two minute opening statement. Uh, yeah, great. <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'm Richard May. Uh, me estoy postulando para el legislador estadal on el distrito 42 aquí. Um, I, uh, I'm currently the, pro, uh, the mayor pro tem of Blaine. I'm a business owner. I'm a father of two. Uh, I've spent 20 years advocating for schools, libraries, working people, and a clean, sustainable environment. Uh, I went to trade school and I worked hard jobs for decades, eventually owning two businesses with 20 employees. So I understand what it's like to try and earn a living, and I also understand uh, the challenges of small business. Uh, in government and in policy, the first thing I do is I, I check with the people that would be impacted by any new changes, and I, I make sure if they have any better ideas on uh, on how these things should work. Um, I, I think that uh, in general, we need basic respect for people in the environment without better, uh, barriers to better working conditions, education, housing for all, health and childcare options. Uh, plus, we really need rural broadband. We, we sure saw that during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, we will certainly need better river management uh, and uh, we need good roads and, uh, and an overall rec uh, recovery for economy and jobs. In the workplace, in small business and in my 13 years in municipal government, I've, uh, I've overhauled what's broken and make uh, the good things work better. Uh, and uh, I, I, I wanna be able to listen to what people's problems are. I have, a, I have a, an established track record of, uh, of results. And uh, if elected, I will, I will not be a, um, a passive backbencher. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be diplomatically assertive and uh, make sure to really uh, reach out and make sure that we, uh, we get the results we need, like, uh, like I always have as an advocate and uh, in my roles in government so far. I've uh, participated in a lot of uh, various boards and commission, including uh, uh, 10 years on the uh, board of directors of a dropout prevention organization, Communities and Schools, which is nationally affiliated. So I look forward to uh, the opportunity to continue to serve this community. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're gonna start out with our first question. I'll start with candidate Timmons and then we'll reverse the order of each question after that. Um, you'll have 90 seconds to respond. Our first question is, what ideas do you have about how the state could assist in increasing the supply of affordable housing for lower and middle-class people in an equitable way? Thank you, Allison. It's a great question. We are experiencing a housing crisis. Uh, I think everyone should be able to afford to live where they work and play and have a roof over their head. Um, last year, our rent went up 35% in Bellingham. 
Uh, my wife and I have a toddler and we're both still paying off our student loan debts. That was a really uh, difficult time for, for our family. And so I know what a lot of people are going through when it comes to challenges in this housing market. Uh, what I would like to do, I think we need to build more housing. I think we have a shortage of a supply of housing in our community. So first and foremost, I think we need to be building more. We have a, a great housing trust fund that helps build affordable units. We have some projects going on right now in this community through the Opportunity Council, Mercy Housing Northwest, utilizing some of that funds. I think we need to keep building through the housing trust fund and ramping up those dollars, putting that on steroids so we can build more affordable housing. Uh, I also think we need to be building more units, more housing around our, our urban cores and particularly transit lines. I think we need to be uh, increasing density in our, in our cities. And that's something that I really support and I think would help make housing more affordable for everybody. And then I think we need to, to, to try to uh, increase access to first time home buying, buying programs. Uh, home ownership is a tremendous way to stop the cycle of poverty. It's a tremendous way to build wealth for a family. And it gives people peace of mind to know that they're gonna have a mortgage without rent necessarily going up over that time. So those are some of the things that I have and it's an issue on top of my mind and something I'd be committed to doing in this position. Thank you. Uh, candidate May, would you like me to re repeat the question? No, I got the question. Okay, you've got 90 seconds. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, I've talked to uh, about 30 different experts on, on uh, what to do about housing and all of them tell me that the other 29 people are totally dead wrong and that they, they know the one true way. So what I've learned from this is we're going to have to come at this with a whole bunch of approaches all at the same time. Uh, I've personally experienced uh, housing insecurity. And, uh, and, and I've, I've certainly talked to so many people that have had their rent raised, as uh, Joe mentioned there. Uh, so some of the various things we need to do, permanently affordable housing, such as land trusts, where the, the pricing is locked in forever. Uh, there's, there's zoning changes we can do, but uh, with, with zoning changes, I think sometimes you have to build in, into the rules that you can't just knock over a single family home and replace it with three luxury condos nobody can afford either. Um, uh, there's a, you know, up in Vancouver, Canada, they have a, a, a rent increase cap of 5% per year is the most that uh, somebody renting can have their rent increased. And now Washington state uh, forbids some of those kinds of laws. So, uh, so we're going to have to find ways of making sure to keep affordability. And definitely we need to uh, reduce barriers to home ownership uh, because uh, people who are just a little below being able to uh, have a home. If they can have a home, then everybody else moves up one notch. And that even goes down to people who have no, no housing at all uh, could move into the more affordable. So we're gonna have to come at it from, uh, from a lot of different angles at once. There's not just one silver bullet uh, magic answer that's gonna solve it for everything. All right, thank you. Um, candidate May, just stay there. We're gonna start with you on this second question here. Um, although the state has recently increased funding for some of early childhood programs, there's still a critical need to expand availability, increase affordability, and retain staff in public and private programs. What is your perspective on this problem? Uh, I, I spent uh, ten, uh, 10 years on the board of directors of, uh, of the uh, Wacom Skagit uh, Communities and Schools, which uh, tries to prepare, uh, prepare people uh, and, and make sure they graduate and keep, them, keep kids in school. And, and a lot of that has to do with wraparound services. Um, and uh, that's uh, part of what my wife does professionally. And uh, I, I, we, we, need to, we, we need to make sure that, uh, the, that uh, all students have the best possible chance moving forward. And sometimes that's gonna take some funding and it's a great investment. We have to think of this as an investment because uh, the, the better that kids do earlier, the better they do in life in general, and that saves everybody money in the, in the long run because then we don't have communities full of uh, boarded up buildings and out of work people that didn't do well and all the, uh, the, uh, the costs that, that are, are associated with people not doing well in life. So it's, it's a worthy investment. We have to find the funding or allocate the funding uh, to uh, especially to uh, early learning and, and, uh, and uh, individualized education plans are very important because uh, one size fits all education uh, and, and preparedness uh, is, doesn't always work, and, and we have to we have to bear this in mind, and uh, and and that includes uh, uh, rewarding kids that are uh, are doing really well, and, and uh, making sure that they, they've got uh, uh, challenging uh, work and and the, the supports so they can they can do the best they're doing. Uh, so so uh, everybody from top to bottom, we ha we have to uh, find the funding and make sure to do those supports. 
Thank you. Um, candidate Timmons, the same question. Would you like me to repeat it? Yes, please. Thank you, Allison. Um, although the state has recently increased funding for some early childhood programs, there's still a critical need to expand availability, increase affordability, and retain staff in public and private programs. What is your perspective on this problem? Yeah, thanks, Allison. Appreciate that. Um, this is, again, this is such a key issue. Um, I, I do support expanding access to that. As you said, three to five. I do support uh, 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 increasing that to lower. Um, previously, before getting into, before going to graduate school and getting into the career that I mentioned in my statement, I worked as a preschool teacher for a year. I was a floater in classrooms, uh, six months to five years old. And I really saw the transformation that uh, children went through um, when they had a positive learning environment at such a young age. Uh, it is a tremendous return on investment. Um, when you invest in early learning, you keep uh, you 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 increase the positive outcomes for children uh, into adulthood. Um, things like staying in school, higher graduation rates, lower incarceration rates, um, paying into the tax system uh, rather than relying upon it uh, for services. So the return on investment in the long run makes a lot of sense. But I think morally, it's the right thing to do. I think every student needs to have access to quality learning. From, from, uh, from early learning through higher education. And that includes the community and technical college. I'm a product of Washington State Schools uh, here, uh, public schools, and I'm very proud to have uh, the endorsement of the Washington Education Association, the teachers union in this state. So from early learning through K-12, through higher education, I think we need to be expanding access and making it world-class for our students so that they can have uh, the lives, quality of life and the careers um, that they want. Thank you, candidate Timmons, and this will start with you for this next question. How can the state assist in solving the problems related to flood control? Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. You know, flooding is is obviously on top of mind for right reason. Um, I think it's it's a very complicated issue and we need to be using all the tools in our toolbox that we can. Um, I'm proud in my work in the governor's office, uh, the governor and, and the premier of BC is working on a transboundary initiative uh, to focus on flood prevention and response. Uh, this is more of a long-term effort that, that we're in the in, um, engagement process on both sides of the border right now. Um, to me, I think we need to be looking at all options and I think we need to be looking at all options through a scientific and technical lens that supports communities, farms and fish habitat. And I think that we need to find solutions that, that thread those needles. I think we need to bring the right folks to the table to find those solutions. That includes, um, uh, I, th I think, people in impacted communities, both upriver and downriver. Um, of course, our tribal, our tribal governments, uh, Lummi Nation and Nooksack Indian Tribe, and our agricultural community. And so I'm open to any idea that's going to meet those three things of protecting communities and uh, pre preserving fish habitat and, and preserving agriculture land. So I'd like to, I'd like, I think we need to invest in this uh, to look at these and figure out short-term fixes and long-term gains. I think there are some things that we can do in the short term. I know Whatcom County is working on uh, a side channel project right now that will hopefully alleviate some of the pressure upriver. And I think we need to be using all the tools in our toolbox and speaking the same language and looking at this thing through a, a scientific lens. Thank you. Candidate May. Um, how can the estate assist in solving the problems related to flood control? Yeah, uh, uh, flood control, flood preparedness. It, it, there, there is a lot, uh, a lot of things going on. I, I, I think there's, uh, you know, five or ten different things that uh, were no-brainers that everybody knew better that they hadn't done, uh, and uh, that we need to make sure are in place uh, so that we don't have this uh, any problems moving forward as in the in the uh, the flood zone. Uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, what I consider to be some uh, predatory developers that sold people uh, brand new condos down in the lowest part of the floodlands and told them, hey, it's, it's in a hundred year flood zone. Maybe once every hundred years, you'll get a flood. And some of these people have had uh, three floods in uh, 20 years. Uh, I think everything needs to be on the table uh, and everything uh, can be kicked off the table if, if the experts uh, don't match it. Uh, we need to talk to hydrologists. Uh, there's, there's right ways and wrong ways to do a lot of these things. You remove gravel the wrong way and uh, you can actually increase the uh, the, the speed of the river and turn it into a vacuum cleaner demanding uh, more gravel. Uh, but uh, so you, you definitely got to consult with the hydrologists and see the right way of doing some of these things. Uh, there's discussion of uh, holding back some water so that uh, 
uh, that way during the middle of the summer when agriculture needs it and actually the salmon need it because when the uh, the river gets too shallow, the, the water heats up and that's not good for the salmon. Uh, I, I had a meeting with uh, John Gargett, the uh, uh, emergency uh, uh, czar for uh, Whatcom County about making sure that uh, uh, if the 911 system gets overloaded, that perhaps uh, there can be a press two to get a peer to peer assistance because that's what people did anyway. Thank you. We'll we'll stick on the environment topic topic right now. Um, a significant way this is good to candidate May again. A significant way to reduce carbon emissions is for homes to be better insulated, to use heat pumps for heating and cooling, and solar panels for electricity. Many people cannot afford these changes. How could the state help solve this problem? Yeah, and uh, you know when you bring up that uh, in general, I, I think the state definitely has to look at uh, electrical generation capacity. If we're going to set these goals, like everybody should have an electric uh, electric car by uh, 2030, uh, and all there is is uh, sixty thousand dollar electric cars, and and uh, we don't have the electricity to power to them, uh, that, that's not going to live up to what uh, what seems like a great idea. And so uh, the, the, the state has to make sure that we can do these things. And, and yes, not everybody can afford to outfit their home uh, with, uh, with solar. And we might consider in some cases that to be a public investment. We might have to look at some innovation to try and find lower cost but equally effective ways of, of doing some of these, uh, the, uh, these important things. And then we also have to make sure there's a just transition of, uh, of any industries and workers uh, that are obsoleted by uh, the uh, the transition away from fossil fuels and towards uh, some of these uh, electric uh, electric based technologies. So uh, we, we have to be thoughtful about it and uh, and uh, and and the, the state may have to come in and, and help because we've got the economies of scale. There's things that uh, a state budget can do that uh, individuals or a local community isn't going to be able to have a, a enough participation to put together the budget to uh, to get the discounts you can get from uh, from doing things on a larger scale. So uh, we, ha we have to bear all these things in mind. And uh, that's about all I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Timmons, the same question. A significant way to reduce carbon emissions is for homes to be better insulated, to use heat pumps for heating and cooling, and solar panels for electricity. But many people cannot afford these changes. How could the state help solve this problem? Thank you, Allison. Uh, yeah, you know, the state's the, the number one um, uh, greenhouse gas pollutant uh, in, in this state is transportation, and the number two is buildings. And so we do need to tackle this issue, but as you say, uh, it, it, it's it's expensive, and I think that we need we need to be um, proactively looking out for people who can't afford these sorts of investments. Um, as I said, our rent went up 35 percent last year. Uh, we all know the cost of living is going up in this community. People are being nickel and dimed everywhere you look, and I'm very very concerned about affordability. So what I would like to do in terms of, of retrofitting these things is programs that provide um, provide a funding from the state for lower income and middle income earners, people who, can, who can't afford it the most. You know, we have a regressive uh, tax structure in this state. And as I said, I think I think lower income people and middle income people are paying more of their of their fair share uh, everywhere you look. And so I would like to provide some relief from the state in terms of these retrofits. And then I think we need to be looking at things, and I, I visited some housing projects recently, including um, uh, today through Colson Community Land Trust, uh, the, the Telegraph Town Home Project, where they're doing passive housing, what they call passive housing. And it's a different way of building that, that from the ground on up looks at reducing energy use. So reduces the need for heat, reduces the need for cooling. So I think there are things that we can do in the building industry that are really unique as well. Thank you. Uh, candidate Timmons, we'll start with you for this next question. With the recent passage of federal gun safety legislation, should any additional state bills be passed? Thanks, Allison, for this question. It is on top of everyone's mind right now. Um, I am um, very humbled and honored um, to be the only candidate endorsed by the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Um, and I, I take that seriously. Um, this, the legislature has made tremendous gains, in my opinion, in recent years regarding um, firearms, and, and that includes uh, banning what are called ghost guns and limiting uh, the rounds of capacity magazines. Um, so I, I applaud the legislature for the courageous steps that they've taken in recent years. I think that Washington State is becoming a leader on this issue, and I think that's fantastic. 
Um, I, I, I support a, a ban on assault rifle weapons, military grade weapons in this state. I don't think that those are necessarily needed for personal protection or hunting purposes. I fully support people's uh, right to bear arms, um, but I, I do not necessarily think that that needs to include uh, weapons that can um, cause great harm in a very, very short amount of time before people can intervene. So that's something that I support. And then I know it's, it's, it's maybe not direct, doesn't seem directly related to firearms, but in my mind it is. Um, we need to invest in mental health counseling and behavioral health in our communities. Um, suicide is, is on the rise. And um, I think that more mental health and behavioral health access is needed in order to prevent um, suicides when people have access to firearms. So those are some of the steps that I really approve. Thank you. Um, candidate May, the same question with the recent passage of federal gun safety legislation, should any additional state um, bills be passed? Uh, Washington State uh, has uh, has some good stuff on the books here. Uh, I think there's uh, some people are resistant to uh, understanding that uh, some things have to be like the way that uh, uh, car licensing is, where yes, you can drive, but you have to prove that you're not going to drive off the road. And if you drink and drive and, and run over people, then uh, your 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 uh, ability to drive a car is taken away from you, uh, and at least until you can prove that you're not going to do that kind of thing anymore. And I, I think that. Uh, there's an extent to which we can uh, uh, treat uh, uh, a lot of the fire firearms like that. I do think that people should be able to have, uh, you know, pistols and rifles in their own home if that's what they're going to do. If they've not uh, shown themselves to be a, a generalized threat, such as being a, uh, a convicted violent felon or someone that's, uh, that is uh, uh, proven to be, uh, and and so uh, uh, yeah. Uh, America has a real big problem right now with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, things going on with guns, a lot of tragic things going on with guns. And so uh, it's one one thing is about making sure that uh, uh, that uh, we, we we know about the access to guns and, and we uh, have a handle on that. But the other thing that uh, uh, Joe mentioned there is uh, uh, mental health and uh, and what what is leading people to behave badly with their guns? Because uh, 50 years ago, things weren't acting like this. So we, we, we need to address that as well. Sometimes things are big picture and systemic. Okay, thank you. Um, this is gonna be our final question before we move to our closing statements. And we'll start with candidate May. How would you describe the principles that guide you in making personal decisions? And how would those principles be reflected in your political decision-making? Uh, great, yeah, in my uh, 13 years in, uh, in municipal government and in my 20 years of uh, advocacy for policies, going to the impacted people even if they didn't, even if they didn't show up with their torches and pitchforks at public comment period, even if they didn't write in letters complaining about stuff, going and finding out from the people who are going to be impacted. If you come up with some great new idea, almost every great new idea is going to have a downside. And so I've always made it my policy to go and find find the impacted people and say, we're going to do this big sweeping thing that we think is a great idea. Is there anything about this that's going to really mess you up? Is there anything about this you're going to dislike? And how can we make it so that you're, you'll oppose this less? How can we make it? How can we mitigate this so that this great idea can happen with uh, without uh, harming you or inconveniencing you or or, or uh, reducing your ability to to do your best? And uh, that's that's one of the most important things. I have a long track record of uh, of results. Of, and, and of doing things this way. And that's what I would want to continue to do uh, if, if elected to the state legislature. Uh, there's uh, several really good idea bills that totally died in committee in the last couple of years. And, uh, and uh, the proponents, uh, the, the legislators who were the proponents uh, fully admitted in retrospect that, uh, that uh, if they'd done more investigation to the uh, impacted stakeholders that they, they could have perhaps, uh, perhaps crafted uh, legis uh, uh, legislative ideas that, that would have held better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, candidate Timmons, your final answer to the, the answer to our final question, how would you describe the principles that guide you in making personal decisions? And how would those um, principles be reflected in your political decision making? Yeah, thank you, Allison. This is a really great question, because I think it gets into um, the leader, the thinking of leaders that, that we elect, which is which is uh, a pivotal part of our democratic process. So 
uh, you know, I pride myself on um, on being someone who can build uh, and maintain lasting relationships. Uh, I've done that throughout my career. I'm very proud of the endorsements that I have from local uh, elected officials and legislators, um, state legislators, um, and others because of because of the relationships that I've built. And I think that people respect and trust and know that I will be there for them. Um, I think treating people with respect first and foremost. Um, and being a listen first leader are things that I really pride myself on being. Um, I think I recognize that I'm not an expert on everything. And so I would need, I, I, I value getting input from people who are. If I'm gonna be making a decision that's going to be impacting a certain industry or, uh, or groups of people, I wanna hear from them what their thoughts are um, so that I can include that in my decision making and, and help balance the pros and cons on all those things. Um, so those are some, some of the things that I really pride myself on being and will continue to um, to in this role, and that includes um, a diversity of of folks. You know, not not limiting myself uh, to certain groups of people, and trying to get a well rounded uh, 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 input from folks. And again, as I said, to be a listen first leader and treat people with respect. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so now we're going to proceed to our closing statements, and it will be in the order that the two of you are on the ballot. So candidate Timmons, you can go ahead with your one minute closing statement, please. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to say thank you again for putting this on. Um, it's, it's, it's really helpful for voters to, to get to know candidates better before they make their decisions. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, I've said a lot uh, about, about myself. Um, I guess what I'll just say in closing is, I really think that my experience in state government, uh, this, the last seven and a half years working directly with leaders in the legislature, the executive branch and state agencies really positions me to hit the ground running in this position on behalf of our community. We all know there's a lot at stake in, in this election. And, and I really think that I can hit the ground running and be um, a, a great representative on behalf of our community in Olympia. Uh, I, I'm very proud of the endorsements that I have. And I think that that shows some of the um, support and, and trust and faith that people put in me, as I said, including the, the Washington State uh, uh, or the Washington Education Association, the Washington State Labor Council, local firefighters, Lummi Nation, um, Pro-Choice Washington, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, et cetera. And you can learn more on my website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Candidate May, your one minute closing statement. You bet. Uh, I've been running a grassroots campaign that's local focused because it should be about what the people of this district, what the people of Wacom want, and uh, not just letting Seattle and Olympia define all the policy that impacts us out here. We've got a very special district out here. We've got agriculture, we've got factory workers, we've got communities, we've got a, a, a lot of uh, different interests that, that need uh, uh, an understanding of what we've got going on out here. And uh, I am proud of the endorsements I've gotten, you know, from the, the labor unions, UFCW, uh, WFC, the laborers, acts to me. Uh, and I have gotten all of the environmental endorsements that, uh, that are given out for this primary, for, uh, for this election. I, I like to be early and proactive. And, and, uh, and that's, uh, I, I don't just show up at the last minute here. I try and get things done long in advance and try and uh, anticipate what the challenges are going to be and, and go and, and troubleshoot them ahead of time. And that's what my uh, track record results reflect. Um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you both for being here this evening and for your interest in running for office. Uh, voters can find more information about the candidates online at vote411.org and in your voter pamphlet. Ballots were mailed out to J today, July 13th, 2022. Your ballot must be postmarked or in a ballot drop box before 8 p.m. on August 2nd. Please remember to sign the ballot envelope, and if mailing by postal service, we recommend that you mail early. Thank you to all who joined us this evening and to our candidates who joined us as well.